Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for a very special conversation between two acclaimed and award-winning poets and authors, El Segundo Poet Laureate Hope Anita Smith and Emeritus Young People's Poet Laureate Jacqueline Woodson. This talk is presented on behalf of the City of El Segundo and its Art and Culture Arts and Culture Committee. My name is Bryn Lopez. I'm an indie bookseller and the manager of Children's Book World in Los Angeles, where we celebrate diversity, knowledge, and enrichment. It is a world where every child sees themselves and each other on our bookshelves. Hope Anita Smith. Hello, Hope. How are you? I'm well, thank you. She is an acclaimed and award-winning poet and author of children's books, including her Coretta Scott King award-winning novel and verse, Keeping the Night Watch, her Judy Lopez Memorial award-winning The Way a Door Closes. Her newest novel and verse was It Rained Warm Bread. Hope is the inaugural poet laureate of the city of El Segundo with a dedicated mission to inspire the city's residents to foster a greater appreciation of words through the creative arts. And I've heard you've had just like the most productive run as the poet laureate in El Segundo Hope. And busy, busy, busy. <laughs> and Jacqueline Woodson is here. How are you, Jacqueline? I'm good. Thanks, Bryn. Thanks. It's so always good to see you. Jacqueline Woodson is a Oh boy, here we go. Is a poet and writer of books for everyone, but specializes in impacting the reading life of children and teens. Her many award-winning and beloved books include Brown Girl Dreaming, After Tupac and Dee Foster, Miracles Boys, uh, Harbor Me, and her newest book release, Remember Us, a uh, love letter to Bushwick, love letter in memory of Bushwick, love it. Um, her many honors include being Young People's Poet Laureate from 2015 to 2017, National Ambassador for Young People's Literature from 2018 to 2019, and the recipient of the Hans Christian Andersen Award, the medal, the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award, and the Langston Hughes Medal. So thrilled to have both of you here to talk to each other about the words and rhythms and meters. Um, I had the great pleasure this Sunday of talking with a global rock star poet and friend of both of you, author Kwame Alexander. And he spoke about the impact and inspiration that both of your works had on him, seeing the possibilities of writing narrative verse for kids. What we talked about was the language like that was just his natural language this was the only way that he could speak was through a poetic language that he found that came natural to him and I, that's how i wanted to start was to just ask you what is this language that you both navigate so beautifully and naturally and when did you realize you had the power to communicate with that language hmm. you want me to start hope oh. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> um, it's such a great question. Um, I think the language that I'm going to speak for Hope and myself just for this part is is truth. You know, mm -hmm. I think one the way that you can write to young people is by speaking the truth to them because they can see through everything else. And so there's a deep honesty that comes from wanting to tell these stories in the ways that I tell them um, and the way uh, that the people I love tell them, like Hope, like Kwame, like Jason Reynolds. Um, and, um, and I feel like it's the only language I know, you know, you know I mean, um, I, we, I'm a fiction writer. I write in a certain way. Uh, and at the core of that is this deep central um, belief that I have that is my truth that becomes the narrative. Yeah, I would agree with that. And and in that truth, with especially with poetry, I feel like you don't waste words with poetry. Um, and so you really kind of get to the heart of things. Um, there's not a lot of, um, I don't know, fluff around it. It really is just kind of like the essence of what you want to say, and you just dive right into that and get to the meat. Do you have good word art? 
can you can you talk to somebody and all of a sudden you spot uh are you a poet like do you do you, can poets spot poets when they're talking to them in conversation i i believe they can i i think i think we can spot poets in in our in when we're talking and also in writing there are a lot of people who write fiction um i read um i read the lovely bones by alice sebold and uh, went to hear her somewhere. And when I read the book, I remember thinking it, there was so much poetry in the writing. And so my question to her was, were you ever a poet? And she told me that she started out as a poet. And um, I think there's something, I mean, look, I, I believe everybody should be writing poetry. There's something about writing poetry that informs and improves all other aspects of writing just because of the nature of what it is. It's kind of like that thing where football players um, take ballet lessons and you're thinking, <laughs> doesn't make sense, but it does. There's, there's, there's something that they're getting that you don't see on the surface, but it all comes out when they're actually playing the game. And that's, that's how poetry works, I believe. Yeah, it's a, it's a living thing, right? I mean, what you're creating is an actual, uh, it's something that is not just on the page. It takes a form and it can be in so many, I mean, it can be vocalized, it can be verbalized from by the reader, but as you, you know, because it's truthful, as you mentioned before, Jacqueline, it, it is this living, breathing thing. But once it's in the book and out to the reader, how do you feel about not having control over it at that point in time? <laughs> Um, you know, it's funny because I, I think it is about um, letting go, right? You um, write the poem, you write the story, and then you send it off like a gift into the world. And, and then the world does with it what they want. So it's not about, I mean, you never have control. I never have control over the poem. I always think of what Cornelius Edie said about sometimes the story knows more than you do about what it's trying mm -hmm. to say. And so you sit down and you start writing, thinking you're gonna write one thing and something else that your characters have another plan for you. And I do think that, so that's your first giving up of control. And then when you, when I write, it's, um, I really, I really expect the reader to meet me halfway with their own experience, bringing their own experience to the narrative and, and thereby being able to see themselves in some way inside of the narrative. So, so that is um, uh, another way of letting go of control. It's like, this is, this, I did what I could do with this baby. Now it's gonna go out into the world and do what it needs to do. And, and it's not mine anymore. It belongs to whoever's hands it, it's in. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I remember the the first book that I wrote. It was it was hard to not let go of it for the world, but even just to let go of it to send it to my editor. I just <laughs> you know, it's, it's like your baby. It was my first. It was my baby. And um, and the funny thing that happened was my editor lost the manuscript on the train, and I just thought, <laughs> my, child, my child is you know, and and of course you know I had it, um, but for that moment, but. I too agree that once the reader gets it, I, I feel like I write from my truth um, and then they get to two things. They get to interpret that however they want, but they also get to see that there's someone out there that ha that shares their story, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're writing from a place of truth, because you know we're we're all connected in crazy kinds of ways. And even if I write about a dog dying and someone reads the book and it's not, their dog didn't die, they had some kind of loss that connects them to the loss that I'm writing about. And so that's that's where, you know, they get to make it their own, like Jacqueline mm -hmm. talked about. They get to now take the story and it becomes what they need from, a, from the book. Have there been experiences um, where a young person in particular, but it could be anybody, um, has come back to you with a response about one and something that you've written that surprised you in some way or made you think about something uh, that you didn't realize that it would have that effect on somebody? Um, I don't know exactly, you know, I don't know how I'm actually, but you know what I'm sort of going towards. I would have to say more than um, how, being surprised by the impact the story had on them. I, I think I've been surprised by who the stories have impacted. Mm -hmm. Like I'm thinking I'm writing to one audience and then I get a um, a letter from someone else. Like I, I remember with Brown Girl Dreaming, 
<clears throat> I I started getting these notes from these white men in their like 70s in Ohio. And I was like, this book about an 11 year old, you know, about a, a young brown girl. And it turned out that they had started passing the book around because of my grandfather on my father's side. He had oh. been their baseball coach, Hope Woodson. And so they're like, is this the Hope Woodson? Or, you know, my friend Charles told me that this was your grandfather. And then they were telling me all the stories about themselves as boys and him being their coach, which blew my mind. Just that that narrative reach in that kind of way. Oh, that's a beautiful example. Yeah, it was fabulous. How about you, Hope? Yeah, it, for me, it's the same with um, who it reached. So I'm am I was amazed that adults were so taken with mm -hmm. um, the book. So when I um, one of my books, I did an in service for teachers, and I think it was it was um, it was the first book. It was the way a door closes, and all the teachers got a copy of the book at that at that program and afterwards I signed all the books and it was amazing that these women or men came up to me and they would say you know I don't live with my kids but I want to make sure that I'm there for them in their life or I want to give this to my husband he's you know he's not in the home but I want him to see so they found they found ways to like use it as a I don't know like not a self-help but kind of like a a manual for how their lives could be different with their children, um, even though they didn't live with them and they, you know, the family was not together. Um, my thing was that I had written it for kids who didn't have fathers in the home. Um, and this one comes back, of course, at the end. And it was kind of a way of giving them something in a book that they may not have gotten in real life. Yeah. You just don't know whose door you're going to open. Uh, when, it's, when it's out there. So um, so with the poet, poetry in particular and in novels and verse, when you're writing a narrative with the with verse, a lot of it is so based on truth and a lot of it personal truth. Are there ever times where you regret perhaps writing something that might be personal and you, you don't have to give examples, but where you <laughs> sort of wrote it and they're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have written that part. I think I've definitely, I know I've written something that I've put out in the world and then I thought, you know, I should have shared it with the people I was writing about before putting it out in the world. And I think that's why with Brown Girl Dreaming, I just showed my, I, everybody that I was writing about who was living, I said, I shared the parts that I was writing um, with them. And I think the difference with that book as opposed to what I wrote back in the 90s was with Brown Girl Dream, I was definitely writing from a place of love and forgiveness. And when I wrote the earlier stuff, it was from a place of, I was still mad. <laughs> so, so and, and I think it came across, to, so it became, it, it was more hurtful than when I was writing mm. from a place of love. That's interesting. Hope? Yeah. I, I don't think, I, I don't have any yet. I don't yeah. have any, <laughs> I don't have any moments where I'm like, oh, I wish I had pulled back. Um, yeah, not yet. Not yet. Well, so interesting, interesting talking about when you're writing younger and you have that there, you know, you're coming at, at with a different intention, with a different emotion uh, in that writing. Has what comes through in the poem of verse ever frightened you? Has it ever like been like, oh, like I'm touching into a place I didn't actually like, did you find something in there that you didn't even realize you weren't dealing with? Yeah, I think yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, the first two books I wrote were about, you know, relationships with dads. And um, yeah, it's it struck a nerve. But I, I think that the strongest nerve for me was when I wrote about my mother. Um, you know, I I started the book at a at a retreat. I wrote a poem, one poem, and um, that poem sent me into the bathroom sobbing. I came back. I shared the poem in the group. Everybody was sobbing. And then, you know, and then I went on to write the book. And then my editor sent me the book to like, you know, go over, see any mistakes. That, and I would have to like put it down because even though my mother passed away when I was 12, the power of it was so intense that I couldn't just, I couldn't just do it. I knew everything that happened, every poem I had already written, but to go back and hear them again, um, 
was it was really it was very painful and i i'm i'm a nice person but i remember <laughs> i went somewhere and i they asked me to read from the book and i thought i'm going to read this poem and like everybody's going to cry this is going to be good right and i got <laughs> up and i read the poem and when you're reading sometimes Jacqueline probably knows this when you're reading for a group of people um, and they're so listening so intently to what you're saying. There is a silence that is just I, 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 don't, I can't even describe it. So as I was reading the poem, that silence was happening in the audience. And I heard myself like I was actually like just it was just me reading the poem. So I was the one who was listening and I was the one. <laughs> who couldn't finish it because I started crying. I, you know, it all reversed. So it's, <laughs> oh my goodness. it's, uh, it's our, the, the words are, they're powerful. Yeah. And sometimes mm -hmm. they come back and, and they hit you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I completely agree. And I know that feeling and you think you're getting yourself prepared, right? You're like, no, I've read this out loud before. I know how, and my voice is not going to crack in the reading of it, but I was, um, I live in New York, but I was um, I was working at home, and Lene Denise was um, at the Schomburg um, with Saul Williams and Tamar Kali, and, and and so this was all on YouTube last night, um, and it's still there. And she was talking about her new book, Why um, Willie Mae Thornton Matters. It's a beautiful book. It's 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 a history of Black women and music and gender and sexuality. I mean, like so much is going on in this book. And before she started speak, she got up to the podium and started speaking about the book, about writing the book. And she says, I want to call the ancestors back into the room. And the first one I want to call is Greg Tate, who was a big music writer and had a huge impact on the artist community. And, and she just stood there for a moment and then she just shook and she's like, you know, he just gave me a hug. And and I and I I was like, whoa, I'm sitting at my computer and I like kind of pushed back mm -hmm. to my table. And I think about that, that that's the power of words that when we write these stories, we are in some way calling back the ancestors, right? We're calling them into the room with us. And and even though we I found stuff like when I was writing Brown Girl Dreaming, I, you know, it became a different book because halfway through it, my mom died. And and I um I just remember thinking as I was writing about her, like, okay, everything I write, I read out loud. So I it sounds a certain way. And I'm like, I'm ready. And the same thing. It's like I can read this poem, I can feel this, but like starting to read that poem and it's like, wow, she's right here. I've just brought her back on this page mm -hmm. and by extension into this world standing here beside me. And, and the energy of that is at once fabulous, right? Because we know the people who leave us don't leave us. And then at the same time, it's like, hey, am I ready to share this with the audience? Am I ready to read this again myself? Like, if this is the moment, is this something, some, a moment that I need to be alone inside of? So it gets complicated. <laughs> and um, I, I remember my friend Michelle Adams was writing a book and she called me and she's like, you know, writing is hard. And I was like, duh. We <laughs> 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 might make it look easy, but nah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I'm sure those audiences are there for you. I mean, that's also the other thing is, is that you were doing that, but that audience is probably just like much of it is trying to give you as much support as possible. Um, I know I had that experience actually with um, the late, great Randall Keenan uh, mm. or let the dead bury the dead. I mean, like the words just, they just, they, yeah. they hit me really, really strong. Yeah. And uh, that I can't like his stuff just impacted me in a way. I've given uh, that book as a gift to, to more people than than I know because it just uh, it's it was just magnetic and and beautiful yeah. uh, what he was able to share there. Um, I want to talk about giving <laughs> language to something, so naming something because that's part of the poet's job is mm. finding new ways to be able to give voice. To, an ex to a feeling or experience. And then sometimes that's what the reader picks up, right? Is the, this new way of looking at something that they may not have, they may have looked at it as something painful and maybe you've changed it. How do you go about, what's the process for 
you know, having that power of naming something in a new and unique way. I'll start. I, I'm thinking of Remember Us because in it, the girl is uh, Sage is 12 years old and and she's going through what we would kind of call puberty or adolescence, you know, transitioning to adolescence. But um, But as all of us remember, it was it was a, a period of melancholy, right? Because we knew something in our life was different forever. And, um, you know, that transitional moment, and it could be around the loss of someone or something, but, but it is this moment as young people where we know the world as we once knew it is no longer there. And, and because that's such an old emotion <laughs> and old, um, transition, uh, I really had to write and rewrite to get to the gut of the feeling of it and 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 Sage's specific feeling because um because otherwise it's just a regular thing that no one has any empathy for. Because <laughs> it's like, yeah, and right. So it wasn't even about something like getting your period or you know growing breast and not wanting breast and all of that. It was about like a, a passage of time and the impact of time. Uh, and so, you know, of course I listen um, to Nina Simone sing, where does the time go? And I, you know, sat with the memory of my own self at that age uh, and the light of that time when, especially fall light, fall light for me is such a melancholy light and such a light about something about to transition into stillness in this way. Um, so, so that's how I do it. I, I think it's about the individual and then really trying to get to the gut of what the emotion is, because that is so deeply specific. Yeah, and, and that her her transitioning paired with the transitioning of her community mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the streets, which are such an essential part of that story as well. Mm -hmm. That really they made like those it, those came together in a beautiful connection. A powerful right. connection, I think. So, um, Hope, how about yourself? I think for me, I'm, I'm, um, I don't know. I, uh, I'm a, a, a metaphor girl. You know, I try to find <laughs> ways to say things um, in more unique ways. I, I don't think I'm a very direct. Um, well, somebody would disagree with that, but <laughs> I, I wasn't always a very direct person, and so. Um, finding ways of using language uh, to express what I needed to say. I think in the first book where um, CJ is acting out and his grandmother wants to mm -hmm. like set him straight and she does this whole analogy thing with place cards at a table and where people should sit and he's acting like, I don't know what you're talking about. And she's like, you sit here. And so I like being able to do that. I like being able to find other ways to get the point across. So, cause I feel like you're, you know, you're talking and you're reeling them in. They're like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you hit them with it. And it's like, Ooh, you can't say I don't <laughs> understand because you mm -hmm. followed all of what she said before. So I think that that's probably it for me. And I think again, when um, um, I actually just did this with a poetry group that I teach at El Segundo, where I said, uh, use, Slogans, you know, because, you know, we we hear all these catchphrases all day long through, you know, television, radio, everything. And um, in in my book, I did. Can you hear me now? That was like one of the big, you know, catchphrases of the day. And it was, you know, the dad trying to communicate with his son and, you know, talking to an empty room. But because he wanted to talk to CJ and CJ, of course, would never like he was so angry that he couldn't be you know, face to face. And so he had found a way. And it's just, it's like learning how to find ways to say what you need to say mm -hmm. indirectly, but still be so on point that, that it's not missed. There's no confusion about what the message that you're trying to portray. So uh, two great female comics, Phyllis Diller and Joan Rivers used to like <laughs> have like these file cabinets and they're home you know apartments that were filled with categorized jokes themes like ideas some they'd never ever use 
but they would constantly, as they were writing things, they would put them away and file them away for later. Do you do that? Do you have notebooks filled with ideas that you have from when you're walking around like, or traveling into a new place and you think of something? Or do you just hope it'll come back again? What is your process for listening and, and um, keeping, treasuring things? I'm too old to hope it'll come back again. <laughs> <laughs> I got to write it down. Notebooks. Yeah. Every, yes, tons of notebooks. And I mean, the back of, I one thing I, I went to a uh, to hear a concert. So all the notes that I, I got an idea while I was there are written on a program from the LA Philharmonic. So mm. yeah, they're everywhere. I, yeah, but definitely. Doorhouse of ideas, photographs of images of people that I might, you know, that are, that remind me of characters that I want to use names. I write down names. There's all kinds mm -hmm. of things. So how about you, Jackie? Oh, you are so much more organized than I am. But, <laughs> you know, and I, I feel think, organized. I just said I have a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's also because you're a visual artist as well. So, right, you're collect. I, I mean, you know, hope. I, I know you know hope's art, but yeah. it's just, it blows my mind how you can you know, organize visually as well as, you know, verbally. Um, and and I, I just got words and half the time they are, um, they're all over the place. So yes, I do have notebooks. Do I remember what notebook I wrote stuff in? No, <laughs> like I try to keep one notebook going till the end, but I have like 10 notebooks. And, and then I even got to the point where I was, I, had, I, I bought these notebooks and had Jacqueline Woodson notebook one, notebook two, thinking, okay, I'll rip. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, thankfully the camera can't see my desk because they're literally three <laughs> notebooks and also paper. It's, and then at night when you wake up with an idea and I'm, mm. I do think, oh, I'll remember that. Like, let me just say it out loud. I get up the next, it's gone. <laughs> So, that, how do you how do you feel about that? I mean, that was what I'm curious as to how you yeah. actually feel when you realize there was something really good. I know it was great; it was going to be brilliant, and I lost it. I do believe that if it's if it needs to be in the world, it'll come back. So, mm -hmm. um, so I don't mourn it too much. Oh, I want to be like you. I, I <laughs> girl, my head hurts sometimes trying to rethink. Oh, what was true. I dreaming or what was I thinking before this? Because I, it just, it was, it was so good in the moment <laughs> that I, of course I won't forget it. I don't need to yes. write it down. It's like embedded in me. And then when I lose yeah. it, and it made me think about children, you know, when you take your, you hear these stories on the news, we were in the store and I turned my back for one minute and the kid is gone. <laughs> and, and that's how it, I said, and that's how it is. Sometimes you have those wonderful stories where they find your child and all is well. And mm -hmm. then you have those tragedies where they don't come back. So, mm -hmm. oh. oh, that's so, that's such a great analogy. Now, have you ever had the experience then of hearing another poet or reading another poem from another poet and realizing that was something that you had thought about writing and, <laughs> and maybe they explored it in a different way, but you're like, oh, oh, that was an idea that I actually had at some point in time to write about, write about it in this way. You know, I do, when I go to readings, I take, I will have a notebook or something to write on. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm reading poetry, I have something to write on because I do get inspired by other poets. Just like just mm -hmm. immersing myself in their language um, allows me, like, unlocks for me my own language. So the writing, and that's how I learned to write. I mean, I remember copying Langston Hughes poems and trying to rewrite them into Jacqueline Woodson poems. <laughs> but I, 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 I really feel like when I want to write beautifully, I'm just reading poets. You know, when I'm writing screenplays or something, um, I'm not reading poets. <laughs> so, so I I do think the immersing myself in the language of really of poets and really great writers helps me tell stories. I I've never heard I've never been like oh I wanted to write that, but I have felt like um, I love the way they said that, mm -hmm. and I do sometimes think about the way that I would say it. 
Um, but I was in a writing group once, and that was the only time I ever saw my work come back to me in somebody else's voice. And then I wasn't in the group anymore. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah, it was bizarre. It was very bizarre. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I felt like I, uh, I, I thought about women, you know, when you live in the house with women, how everybody gets on the same cycle. And I mm -hmm. thought, you know, everybody starts, you know, you when you're around each other like that, sometimes if you're not careful, without even realizing it, people start saying, I mean, like, some of the words were like verbatim, and it had just been shared the week before. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to need to bow out, you know, too much to do. I need to focus. Mm -hmm. And and then that was it for me. So, but Rather yeah. than give away IP? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it is so interesting, though, Jacqueline, what you were saying is like, you know, across generations with poets from Langston Hughes, uh, uh, you know, all of these different poets, that they can inform your craft that they not, should not be afraid of, of that because I think the great, the great writers uh, and the great poets do allow other people's work to help inform their own craft as they're creating mm -hmm. and writing. And mm -hmm. that's a powerful tool mm -hmm. to, to yeah. use. I was at this writing retreat um, <clears throat> in, um, in Italy, which I'll tell you about in case you want to go to. Um, but it, uh, uh, there was a poet there, um, Sharif Shanahan, Shanahan, who's a Chicago poet. And he can re he recited all of this poetry from memory. And I'm just like, I want to follow you around because every time you speak, I just want to, you know, my mind just opens up. And, and I think that's such a gift to have. But yeah, it is. And it, it, it could be you know, my, what I'm writing has nothing to do with the poem aside from the energy, right? So if a poem just speaks to me in a way that it's like, yeah, this is the energy I'm trying to get to. Thank you. Bye. Now <laughs> let me tell my story. Not bye to Sharif. I could have him around me always. <laughs> um, I want to ask you both about being fearless in your work and then in your life. Which one is easier? <laughs> is there like, uh, and uh, are you? I mean, like, is that even a, a, a thing, being fearless? Uh, I don't mind starting. Um, <laughs> I don't you. know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm fearless, but I'm not fearful. You know, mm -hmm. I don't walk through the world filled with fear and dread. I mean, I, I think I'm a little nutty not to, given this world we're living in right now. But but I do think at the end of the day, um, what what do I have to lose, right? What do I have to lose by telling my story? What do I have to lose by being a writer? What do I have to lose by um, working towards social justice or, mm -hmm. or raising young people? Like all the ways that people get afraid. I think, um, I don't, I don't, but, but, um, but it, but it is, it, it's definitely a journey that tries you every single day. Right. But, but, I, and I also think cause I'm older and, and I've, I've lived thankfully a great life that in some ways I'm willing to fight really, really, really hard for what I believe in. And, and I mean, when you look at us and you think of the people who came before us who had to be, had to walk through the world, not fearfully um, to get to where they, they, they were so we could be where we are. It makes me think this fight is an easy one. <laughs> um, for me, I would say, I, I think sometimes I am fearful, but I, I know there's a book that says what feel the fear and do it anyway. And mm. I, feel, I feel like that's what I do. So in mm. the moment I can, I can have that, that, that feeling of fear or dread or whatever. But as soon as I tackle whatever it is I'm doing, all that has to go away because no one else gets to know about the fear. And, and mm. once you're doing it, 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 it's over. I think it's just the, un, the not knowing sometimes of things. Yeah that make it come. 
But as soon as you start doing the thing, you realize that, well, we're in it, you know, and now we mm. just keep do whatever we need to do to, to finish it up. So that's my that's, story, I think. That's such a great point. I want to ask you both about the um, discipline of creativity. How you actually, what is your process for yourself that you have found that actually works for you? And do you give yourself room within that process for surprises, space for, you know, things to change or adapt? So both of you, I'm sure, have your own unique do you have to be in a certain space? So just just a sort of general, what is the process? My process is chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have children, but you know, my my job, I, I don't have children, but I have children. And um I tend to like to work around a little bit of chaos. I don't mm -hmm. like working in like quiet. Um, the the chaos or the noise around me helps me focus in on what I'm doing, um, and so that that works for me. Libraries have I love libraries. I love librarians, but libraries have never been good places for me to create because they're, they're, they're quiet. They're so quiet. Mm -hmm. I like the noise of like a coffee shop. Or just mm. outside where stuff is going on around me. And I, I did read somewhere where they said, do not, you know, as a writer, do not go to a coffee shop to write. Because it's kind of like you're saying, oh, what you're inviting people to come and approach you. What are you working on? What are you doing? You know, so, you, so it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you, that you're not trying to draw attention to yourself. But I tend to like a little chaos. And I don't, I mean, it's not, it's not a good thing. Um, but I don't have a you know, like from four to eight, you know, you're sitting at your desk. I wish, mm -hmm. um, I think right now I can't see my desk, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's very, it's very chaotic. I, it, I, I strive, I don't know what Jacqueline's going to say, but whatever, she's gonna <laughs> say, I'm sure I strive to be more like that. <laughs> I, that's so fun. So do people actually come up to you at the coffee shop to ask what you're working on? Yeah, they do. People, people, I mean, look, people in coffee shops, for the most part, they want to talk. Mm -hmm. that's, that's <laughs> they come because they're, they're just there with their Joe and they just, they want to have a oh, conversation. My goodness. So, you know, and this face says, approach me because mm -hmm. I'm not going to say, I'm busy. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't mm -hmm. even make a stern enough face to send them away. So yeah, it's, it's not, it's not a good, but I just, I put on, I put on music sometimes I sit mm -hmm. outside. There's, you know, unfortunately, you know, um, there's enough noise in the neighborhood because there's always a gardener somewhere doing uh -huh. something, blowing something, you know, <laughs> I just, I, you know, I said, if I, when I get a house, I want everybody to do it all on the same day because yeah. one day it's here, the next day it's here, but it's always, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I need a little bit of chaos in order to focus in and Wow, that's so impressive. I mean, there's definitely chaos around me. Like my dogs are up in the country, so they're not here to provide chaos. But um, at the minute I sit down to write, my earphones go on. Mm -hmm. um, and even if I'm on the plane or something, my earphones say, don't talk to me. Like, and even if, even if there's no music coming out of them, I make believe there is. <laughs> um, so, but, um, but, but there, I, I think I'm a little like you hoping that Stuff is always happening around me. And if it's not, I'll find something to make happen. <laughs> so that, um, so like part of me, I'm, I'm probably when I get off this call, I'm going to go back and write for about a half hour. Then I'm going to recycle some boxes, go upstairs and do something and, and then come back. And so a lot of that movement happens. Um, but at, but deadlines really help me to focus and I make editors give me deadlines wow. and, um, and they make a difference, but my but usually when I'm sitting down to write a book, headphones go on and music, and and I try to be in that moment just a little long. I'm working on screenplay stuff so I can move around. Right. Um, in writing for kids, which both of you do so beautifully, um, I want to ask you about the intention, the work of the intention when writing for kids, because there is an 
ethical aspect to writing for kids and i don't mean it mm -hmm. in a judgment on the ethics of mm -hmm. it but the, but there is like you're thinking in terms of the messaging sometimes that you're putting across to kids mm -hmm. um what is that process like the for for writing with intention for young people um or does it play a part maybe it doesn't I go back to what Jackie said first uh, earlier about just truth. You know, you mm -hmm. want to be honest with them. So my thing is about being honest um, and not um, dumbing anything down. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes they will say, well, you know, they don't, they won't understand. They don't know. And I believe that um, some of them will know. And the ones that don't, they will learn something. It's like, give them, mm -hmm. give them something to, aspire to or to learn about so those are those are two things that i really when i'm writing when i as i'm writing for them those are the things that i'm that i'm thinking of mm -hmm. yeah i totally agree with hope i think um you know with a good book kids are going to visit it again and again and mm -hmm. each time they're going to get something new out of it or understand it on another level so that's what i know about writing for them i mean i have small rules like i don't curse in books for young people. I just, I think it breaks the dream of the fiction in some way, like you're reading it. And if you're reading lyrical language and then there's a curse, it's like, oh, wait, no. So I'm in a book now. Like, um, so, um, but I do, I, 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 I always just like when I get the letters from kid teachers or kids, like, what were you trying to teach me in this book? I was like, I wasn't trying to teach you anything. <laughs> I wanted you to have a good story. And if it changes you, it changes you. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. But we're not, you know, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not trying to get up here and write a textbook. So, um, but, but I do, I do, I, again, I agree with hope that it, it comes back to being deeply honest and and talking to oneself. Like I feel like I'm talk I'm always talking to my young self when I'm writing a book for young people. Yeah, I try to as a bookseller for 30 years, I've always mm -hmm. tried to get parents to be able to read books not together, not a read aloud necessarily, but to read books with their kids. Because the reason why a child so often goes back to reading the same book over and over and over again is because they don't, they want to re-engage with the story mm -hmm. that has moved them in some way, but they don't have someone to be able to engage with about that particular book. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, as parents, if you read the book and then we're able to, just like we do as adults, when we talk to somebody about a book that we mm -hmm. loved, yeah. that's what a kid is looking for. And um, the second part of that, of course, is that and Jacqueline, you know this better than anyone with your adult uh, literature and then middle grade literature. There's no better place to write. Middle grade to me, middle grade going into young YA is the closest to that adult literary fiction that mm -hmm. we love. Like there's just a That's way to be able to tell emotional stories that I wish more adults actually read them. They're like missing mm -hmm. out. Yeah, I, I do wonder about that, about when, um, publishers started putting those demarcations in, right? This book is a middle grade book. This book is young mm -hmm. adult. This book is adult. When you look at a book like The Outsiders or if Bill Street could talk, like those would probably be considered young adult books now, right? And mm -hmm. and I do think we're missing whole swaths of readerships. I mean, I read The Bluest Eye when I was in fifth grade. I didn't understand anything, thought Cola mm -hmm. lived happily ever after. I had, oh, you know, I, I, I got, I compartmentalized and got what I could out of it. And then kept reading it. But going back to um, what you were saying about adults reading with their young people, it's such a good point, right? Because it is such a converse, conversation starter and it, and the window is small because my son is 15. He reads what he's been assigned to read. And, you know, I'm like, oh, wait, so you're, you're um, you know, I forgot what he was. Um, he's reading Trevor Noah's book, um, Born, um, what's it called? Born. Uh, um, born a crime. Born a crime, and I read that a while ago, and I'm like coming back to reread it because I'm like, oh, we'll have something to talk about because he's 15 and we, you know, has nothing to say to me half the time. Mm -hmm. But um, but but that that window closes and those conversations stop having. I mean, some parents are lucky enough to get lifelong readers. I'm a writer. Um, my daughter reads. My son. Not so much. And 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 I do 
um, mourned that period until he was about 10 years old, where we talked about books all the time and we read together. He let me read to him and all of that. So, so thank you for saying that. And I can't, I can't, I can't co-sign on that and all of that. <laughs> Right. Um, so we're getting towards the uh, end here. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask you uh, last thoughts about the, the writing process, um, particularly about, because we're just talking about words, having to fight to have certain words within your actual poem. Like, and I don't mean fight with somebody, it's, I mean, like the the grappling that you do with being able to complete a poem and mm -hmm. then sometimes having to let words go that you desperately wanted to have inside that, that verse and then you just had to let it go. What is that process for? When do you know that the poem is finished or at least finished in your hands and off to somebody else? I don't know. I feel like for me, it's like, it's like, you just know, I, you know, I don't know how, you know, I think when mm. I'm, when I'm, if I, when I've written it, like sometimes I'll write a poem and then you feel like you, that can't be it, right. That it can't be done. Right. So you're, you're trying to squeeze in more, you're trying to add something and it just, it just doesn't flow. It just feels no, it feels crammed in like something you just kind of, you know, tried to shove into the mix. And so then I have to go back and read it again. And just so it's it's about for me, I, it's it's a thing about learning how to let enough be enough. You know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. not trying to like make it go on and on and on. It's like, did you say the thing you wanted to say, Hope? Yes. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's stop. How about that? I've said what I wanted to say. And and now and that's the end of it. It's so true. It's it's a wrap. I I feel that way more in books. Uh, I um, I let it go, and like in books that are written in verse, I don't always change it. But when my individual poems, like I came across a poem that I was um thinking I was going to submit, but then I found out someone had already published it. I had forgotten. But but I I I I was steady changing it. I wrote it two years ago, and I was steady changing it. And, and I was thinking that, you know, okay, I loaned it to you. I loaned that version to you. And now I'm, now I'm, I'm taking it back and I'm, I'm <laughs> writing a new version. So I, I, and I do find sometimes I look at the poems I wrote and thought, okay, I need to, I, I need to just swap these two words out. And I'm glad I can't do that in books because I, I would be, even mm -hmm. when I'm reading, I don't know if you do this, hope, but when I'm reading, my books, I'm still changing words. And it's like, hope I, I tell kids not to read along with me because they're gonna be like, Miss Woodson, no, that's not the word there. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I do, I do editing. for a film director, I feel like I've, I've, I've bypassed that. I've gotten over that <laughs> because he, you know, my boss, he's, you know, for script writing, the changes are constant, constant, mm -hmm. constant. And he'll say, mm -hmm. we're, this is, this is it. We're, we're wrapping this one up. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> And sure enough, we're not. So I, I mean, when I'm reading what I've written, like when I read books, the books that I've done, I have to just like make myself not go to that place because we yeah. would redo every, you know, there'd be something in every book that we mm -hmm. wanted to fix or, oh, this could mm -hmm. be better if we did this. And I, I am grateful for the gift of the next one. Cause that one is, <laughs> that one's over, it's done. So I, I don't even allow my, it's such a, you know, it's kind of like that longing that just stays with you for, it just keeps mm -hmm. going. Like mm -hmm. it's been around for 10 years or 20 years and they do a new edition. Oh, we can fix yes. that, right? I'm just yes. like, let's not even, let's, it's done. <laughs> I don't know, you know, film, <laughs> you talk about filmmakers and, and, and you're writing, you're working on screenplays, Jacqueline, but, but, uh, but there are extended editions. There could be the, you know, the extended <laughs> edition with special commentary uh, uh, <laughs> of, of this book. My goodness. Uh, the original, <laughs> but you can watch, you can read it and look at it. Well, our final note, our final question is that um, I know that both of you have been uh, authors who have, creators who have opened the door for young people 
or other adults as well into a world of reading that just, you know, gave them a whole new creative literary life. Um, I want to know who that was for you, either a poet, a poem, mm -hmm. or a book that opened the door. You may have already been a reader for a long time, but it was the one that made you go, oh, mm -hmm. oh, this is the space I need to stay in, I need to be in. I would, uh, I'm happy to answer that. I, I always talk about three books. So the first is Stevie by John Steptoe, which mm -hmm. gave me my own, gave my own language back to me, you know, finally hearing people who spoke like my people did. Um, and then of course, Mildred Taylor's Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, mm -hmm. where it was uh, another brown girl. And I was like, yo, here I am again. And then I, I would have to say Raymond Carver, like later on, um, just because of minimalism, I was like, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be a minimalist like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So, so not necessarily always poets, but definitely mm -hmm. wordsmiths. Yeah. Um, for me, it was uh, first um, um, James Weldon Johnson, mm. um, because I did oratorical in school. So like the creation was one of the first things that I learned. And then um, Langston Hughes, the Madam Poems. Um, that was another big one for me. And then I heard Maya, um, I heard her speak every time she came to California. Um, I, re I was in college and my, the dean of religion, he said to somebody, go find hope. And so they found me and he took a group of us to Redlands University and we sat down and Maya walked out on stage and she did um, a poem by, I think it's County Cullen. She does not know her beauty. She thinks her brown body has no grace, but if she could dance and she threw her arms back and she did this little sway. <laughs> and I remember my mouth fell open and I said, I want to do, I want to do that. I want to be yeah. her. And what I always appreciated about her was that every time I heard her speak, she might do one of her poems, but her thing was about bringing all the poets that were gone back to us. You know, certain people we know, but she would, you know, and she just, she had this, you know, this memory bank, the, the guy that you followed around who just recited, mm -hmm. and she could, she recited poems by everyone. Um, um, Edna St. Vincent Millay, you know, um, uh, the one about I, um, I will die, but that is all that I will do for death. I mean, just, <laughs> just so beautiful, you know, the, the, the brown boy hiding in the whatever, I will not, you know, turn him in, you know, he mm. will not you know, be taken by the whip because of me. It was like, <laughs> listening to her was so powerful. Um, and those were the voices, those, those people were the first ones who kind of like just cemented poetry into my brain um, and learning to having it at the ready. You know, there's something about having mm -hmm. a poem at the ready when you go somewhere. I know that, um, you know, there are people that used to have salons in their homes and people would do things. You would sing or you would play an instrument. You mm -hmm. might, you know, whatever, but you shared something. And there was, there was that thing. It's like in school, you learned, you learned a poem. And so everybody would have something like that at their disposal. And it was, it was powerful. And there's something about, you know, when I teach kids, I tell them about in delivering. Looking at the book and saying, da 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 da. But it's another thing when you can look at your audience, when you can mm -hmm. contact. And it's like mm -hmm. you're talking to them then, right? It's like you're telling them the story. And there's there's a power in that. And I want kids to to be able to know that. I don't, you know, I don't have a lot of, I don't have very many of my poems memorized. Actually, from any of my children's books, nothing. I have a couple of adult, adult poems that I've written that I know by heart. But as a general rule, they're you know they're they're on paper, but they're not up they're not up here. I wish. I mean, yeah. I, the impact would be amazing. But you both continue to inspire uh, new writers and new poets and old writers and old poets and when you come in contact with them you're carrying on that tradition of those people that you admired and i can't thank you enough for being here today to be able to share your thoughts on this because i know it's going to impact people who are going to be able to watch it and enjoy this conversation between the two of you i can't you know you're two of my favorite 
poets and creative people in the world. Um, Thanks, I, I, I really, you really are. And I just love experiencing um, what you release out into the world and take it into my heart. So um, thank you both so much for being here today. And uh, I look forward to hearing, and ho hope, uh, I can't wait to uh, uh, hear how it affects the people of El Segundo. I think it's so wonderful. You're working with adults, uh, adult poets now, right? You're doing workshops with adult yes. poets. Yes, yes. That's wonderful. So cool. they're really, yeah, they're really great. Yeah. You know, Jacqueline, Hope and I, we've known each other how long? I'm mean, probably close to 25, 30 years. Um, but we also used to do slams, poetry slams with kids here at the bookstore that were wow. off the chain. We had kids from seven, oh my seven to 14 who would come in and we would be blown away, right, Hope? Oh, <laughs> wow. I think the first one, a seven year old one, she, yeah. I mean, she just, Clean the house. <laughs> the, 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 the young woman who looked like Scout from To Kill a Mockingbird. Yes, that's right. That's <laughs> wow. She blew us away. She was seven years old. Mm -hmm. And there was a young man who was doing a take on Langston Hughes' take. Uh, I mean, like, do you remember that? It was it was really right after Trump. And it was like, uh, yes. was like, and he was so dynamic. These kids just, like, the power of giving kids a voice yeah. through their own words is amazing. Wow. What years was that? I know we, the Trump year. Oh, so. it was right after he was elected, 2000, mm -hmm. so it was the July. I think that was the mm -hmm. first one we did was the July after that. Uh, so 2017, I think. So, wow. um, and um, we did about eight, 12, uh, 10 of them, I think. And they were all just incredible. It sounds amazing. Yeah, wow. it, was, it was pretty amazing. The freedom of it all. Anyway, it was so it's such a pleasure to be able to speak with you both. And I hope you both have a wonderful. Uh, you're going on tour for your book, right, Jacqueline? Right. Yes, yes. There's yes. California in the mix. What, what, what's it's, up it's with coming. that? I'm going, I'm going to do something with reparations. Okay. Reparations right. Club, and yeah, I forgot where. I can tell you when I'm going to be in California. Um, you know, they're still putting this together. Yeah, uh, I think it's uh, the 23rd of October, somewhere around then. 23rd, okay. 23rd, Wonderful. So. Well, well, thank you both so much. We will see you yeah, again soon. My friend, by Hope. Congrats bye again, bye, Hope. So good seeing your beautiful face. Oh, it's bye. good to see you. Love you. Take care. Love you. Take care. Okay, one second, Hope. Yep. Okay, one second, Hope. Yep.